So thank you very much. This is a fabulous uh, day and, and series of sessions. Um, it's fantastic to see all this experience in one place. I want to apologize right off the bat. I'm going to hang on closely to my water. I have a little bit of a, a cold thing going on. Somebody gave me advice one time, if you're feeling under the weather, go to Stockholm. But I think they were talking about in June, not, not, not in December. But here I am anyway, so hopefully I'll make it through a few minutes. Um, I'm going to answer that question in the course, I think, of, of, uh, of what I say. Um, there's, first of all, I guess I should get to the slides. How do I do that? Am I going the right? Backwards. Keep going. There we go. Okay. Um, the, uh, for, for people that are experienced in delivering care in underserved areas, um, this is really um, obvious that we should be doing this. But for those of you that are not experienced in that, this seems like it should be obvious, but medicine is an incredibly conservative and slow moving thing and um, innovations are not easily adapted. And we have a long history, unfortunately, of issuing guidelines that are just cookie cutter, that everything should be done exactly the same for each patient. Um, six, uh, one to two month refills for drugs and HIV, DOT and tuberculosis. So we have a lot of things that have been done for years and years and years and considered quote unquote, the gold standard. And what you're hearing about is a movement that's being fueled by um, opportunity, and we've heard about that today, to mobilize resources to change the course of these epidemics, and efficiencies that need to be found because of budgets and where we're going with that. So I'll go through a few things that the Global Fund is working with partners, and not doing alone, to try to do. Um, so first of all, just a, a quick summary of the Global Fund investments over the years. And you can see considerable amounts, 28 billion invested as of August 2015. And uh, thanks um, to the government of Sweden, which has consistently been within the top 10% of the donors that create this pool of money. And it's not just money, this has led to, as of 2015, an estimated 17 million lives saved. And we estimate that by 2016, that'll go up to 22 million lives saved. So um, there's a lot of good work being done by all the partners. The challenges in front of us have been discussed earlier today. These are the disease plans in AIDS, TB, and malaria that all call for the possibility of control, um, not elimination, but you know, close to that, um, epidemic control, whatever terms one wants to use, by the time of 2030. But to get there, there's an initial investment that um, all three disease areas and their strategies are calling for based on a consortium of modelers and other um, sophisticated quantitative means to get to that estimate. So how do we deal with that? So within the Global Fund, um, if you just look at, the, I'll just take, a, uh, um, for the sake of time, one or two points off each slide. If you look at the blue bar on the right, that's the estimated needs that the Global Fund and many partners are calculating for the next period of 2017 to 2019. If one goes with an estimate of roughly a similar replenishment in 2016, the Global Fund will have about 80% of that, uh, of that total. So the question is, how do we get to these ambitious goals of disease control with the same or less resources? And so it, we, we advocate and we, we appreciate your advocacy. We want more. Ultimately, we want to do more with more. And what you're hearing about today is a whole series of efforts to try to get to that point. So what we've started to do is uh, learn from many of the people that have presented here today um, with the hypothesis that in places of weak systems for health and weak health systems, uh, there are some shining lights out there. There are some places that are doing fantastic work to find efficiencies through very, very direct and in a way simple management um, approaches, not fancy new technology sometimes, but at the core using data using data that's locally derived from patients. And again, we've heard a lot about that today, and I'll highlight a couple of those things. So what we've done is we've tried to go out and figure out, while we try to get to um, fantastic systems for health that we all aspire to, where are those places that are finding these workarounds, these very specific ways at the site level to work closer with communities and to change practices and ultimately to differentiate to find these efficiencies and qualities. So we've taken a look at health facilities and included in that communities. And we have uh, gone through a phase of discovery and we're trying to dis disseminate and package some of these practices with partners and ultimately demonstrate that they can be scaled up. 
So here uh, is how we started. We did uh, a, a lot of interviews, literature review, and some field visits initially to Kenya, Uganda, and Senegal, and it included uh, understanding more and learning from some of the work you've heard today from MSF and other partners. And so based on those observations and that formative work, like things like adherence clubs, like the greater engagement between facilities and communities, and very much based on data, program data, and also client data. Uh, in these three countries, we visited a number of facilities to find out what they're doing and how they're going about doing this work. And so uh, out of that, we've um, synthesized some ideas, uh, again, with partners about differentiated, and I'd really focus on the top three there, one, two, three, differentiated approaches to screening and testing, treatment and care models, and drug dispensing models. Again, you've heard about those today. So I won't go into a lot of detail, except just to, again, reemphasize that this is based on, and it was really implicit in some of the presentations and not explicit, is it has to be based on data. It has to be based on qualitative data and quantitative data. So again, what you've heard today, which sounds obvious, like in any marketing first year business school, this is what you would do. In medicine, we haven't done this effectively. And so what you've seen today are examples of um, segmenting the clients, if you will, according to uh, gender, according to age, according to where they live, according to their health condition, their history of adherence, all those factors and others you've heard about. So we tried to collect what some of these sites are doing, and particularly I would focus on um, the aspect that has been emphasized today of gender, of marginalized populations, of human rights, but also practical things like distance and like whether the person has a job or not. And so these things have all been factored in, and this is an example which we haven't heard about today, but is certainly another great example of this at Tasso, where what they told us was, we didn't, we didn't start with this great innovation. We started with a budget that got cut and more patients we needed to see. So what did we do about it? So we had to segment our patients. We had to learn more about them. We had to change our practices to figure out which people, we've heard today about people coming in less often. There are some people that need to come in more often. There are some people that need double DOT. There's some people that need more intensive. We heard a little bit about it, but just to emphasize, it's not a cookie cutter approach. It's a differentiated care model based on local data. So what they've done is they've done exactly what we just heard some about. They've gotten into community drug delivery points and community-led ARVT delivery that gets closer to the home, and they've found efficiencies and increase in quality that both go hand in hand. And so as we have taken some very, very gross extrapolations from some of the models that we've examined. We've looked and made estimates without going into the details of those numbers about hundreds of millions of dollars that can be saved if this were done across the portfolio of where Global Fund supports. This is 10 or 20 percent improvements that are doing more with more. They're finding money in the system, using it more effectively, but also, as we just heard in the last presentation, getting better outcomes. So it's not just about cutting costs. So what we're doing right now is we're in a dissemination phase with colleagues in these countries, but particularly Kenya has taken this more aggressively. And they are working in um, remember 18 or 20 of their counties. They have a quality control officer that just came to Geneva last week to do a presentation at a collection of partners that are working on this area. And it's fantastic. They're out there um, putting together manuals because, it, again, you can't just issue a single guidance to say, here's what you should do. What you can do is issue a guidance to say, here's how you go about figuring out what you should do. And they're doing that in Kenya to adapt to their different situations. So this is just a, a quick summary of these three countries where we're supporting and working with colleagues to um, uh, develop approaches and, and um, uh, analytical tools that will give clinic managers the opportunities to find some of the efficiencies and some of the improved qualities that you've heard about from some of the wonderful MSF presentations today. I didn't make a slide of it, but um, there was just a meeting last week. I want to emphasize just how um, MSF has been at the lead of this, uh, Tasso has been at the lead, some other individual places. But now there was a meeting last week that had Gates, 
IAS, MSF, WHO, World, which is putting out new guidelines in this area, World Bank, PEPFAR, and we're incorporating now um, tuberculosis partners because this is absolutely something that needs to be done among TB service delivery sites and not only HIV. And so again, we're, we're not, um, the Global Fund is not a technical agency, but what we do have is a leveraging power to incentivize this kind of practice and these kinds of behaviors uh, in countries. And I think, again, we, we've heard about so much of these pieces today, so I just want to go back to what a fantastic collection of presentations it was, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you, so thanks.